In Matthew, the 24th chapter, Christ listed 17 signs of his return. Of those 17 signs, 16 of them have been fulfilled. Tonight, Pastor Cox is going to be talking about the different signs that Scripture gives us about the soon return of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at these signs and see where we're standing in the stream of time. We're going to look at some very interesting things where he talks about the stars falling from heaven and the moon turning to the color of blood. You don't want to miss the presentation this evening. So let's go and listen as Pastor Cox talks about the signs of Christ's return. We're very happy to welcome you, Chucky. They tell us that we are about 255,000 miles from the moon. And they say that the moon has very little oxygen on it, dark on one side, and yet man has spent billions and billions of dollars trying to discover where the moon came from, what holds it in orbit, what effect that it has on this earth. We have sent people off to the moon to bring back samples of it and everything, but when you pick up the Bible, you begin to study it, you find that the moon has something to do with the signs of Christ's coming. In fact, the Bible has some very clear things to say about it, and I'd like for you to look as it talks about the moon and the things that we can see there. It says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So God said, that we could expect signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. It continues on. It says, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. So God said that there would be certain signs that we could look for, that the sun was going to go dark, says the stars would fall from heaven. It continues. says here in Mark, and in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. Now, when you're studying God's Word, you'll find that not only is what God's telling us, what He says important, but the order that God says things in is also important. A lot of people in studying Scripture, they miss that. And when you're reading it, when God puts it in a certain order, you better believe it's in that order for a reason. And he says there would be signs first in the sun. And then he said the next would be in the moon and then in the stars. They're given in that order for a reason. Now he begins to tell us what we can look for, what we can expect in those signs. And it goes on here and says, in the book of Revelation, and I looked, and when he had opened the sixth seal, behold, there was a great, great earthquake. The sun became black as the sackcloth of hair. So he says the sign that you and I could expect in the sun was that it was going to go dark, come black. And then it says, and the moon became like blood. Yeah, the moon was going to turn the color of blood, and it says that the stars we're going to fall from heaven. Now, it also says in the book of Acts, the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. That text is taken from the Old Testament out of the book of Joel. And it says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So you and I can look for signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. You see, in Christ's day, his disciples also were looking for signs. Christ had told them many things that were going to happen, and you find in Matthew, the 24th chapter, that his disciples came to him, and they asked him basically three questions. They were trying to understand what was going to happen, and the three questions that they asked him in verse 3 are these. They said, when shall these things be? They want to know, when are these things going to be? When are they going to happen? What, when's this going to take place? The other question they asked him was, what shall be the signs of thy coming? They said, when are these things going to be? What's going to be the signs of thy coming? They want to know, when is this going to happen? And the third question they asked him was, 
and the end of the world. They put all that together. They said, when are these things going to be? What's going to be the signs of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus begins to list these signs one after another. Now, in those disciples' minds, they could not differentiate between the end of the world and the destruction of Jerusalem. They just couldn't do that. So when you pick up the 24th chapter of Matthew and begin to read it, you're going to find that intermingled in that chapter are signs concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and signs concerning the coming of the Lord. You need to read it and find out which is talking about each one. But Jesus starts out and gives you some real good advice concerning the coming of the Lord. Listen to what he says here in Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 4. And it says, And Jesus answering said to them, Take heed that no one, what? Deceives you. He said, Now watch out. Be careful. Make sure that nobody deceives you. You're going to have to get in the book. You're going to have to study it to make sure that you aren't deceived. What's going to keep you from being deceived? How do you know I wouldn't deceive you? What, what way do you have to keep from knowing that you won't be deceived? Well, the only way that you have is this book. You've got to get into the Scripture. You've got to see what it says. You've got to study it. You've got to know what it says to keep from being deceived. You can't be like the fellow, you know. They asked him, they said, why do you believe? He said, oh, I believe the same thing my church does. And they said, well, that's fine. What does your church believe? He said, oh, my church believes the same thing I do. <laughs> and they said, well, what do you and your church believe? He said, oh, we both believe the same thing. <laughs> now, you just, you know, you're going to have to get in the book. You're going to have to find out what it's talking about. That's the only way you can keep from being deceived. And Jesus said, when it comes to signs concerning his coming, be careful, watch out, make sure that somebody doesn't deceive you. All right, now listen as he continues on. And he says to the disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Now he said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation is near. Now let me tell you something. The Christians believed what he said, and not one Christian lost their life in the destruction of Jerusalem. Not one. You realize it was what Jesus said about the temple that cost him his life. You know, he had said, this temple will be destroyed. You remember? And he said there would not be one stone left on top of another. You remember him saying that? They yelled blasphemy. You know why they yelled blasphemy? That temple in Jesus' day was one that had been refurbished by Herod. That temple had stones in it that were eight foot tall, eight foot thick, and 40 foot long laying on top of one another. And when he said they wouldn't be, there wouldn't be one stone left on top of another, they said, this man's crazy, that's blasphemy. The Roman general came up and surrounded that city. Then, for absolutely no reason, and in history there is no recorded reason for this, he withdrew his army. And when he withdrew his army, every Christian fled the city. And then he came back up and surrounded it. Told his soldiers that they were just going to starve the people out. And so they waited, just waited. Wouldn't let the people out of the city. The things that went on in Jerusalem at that time are beyond imagination. People would sneak out at night out of the gates to pull grass. And if they were caught by the Roman soldiers, they were crucified on crosses until the whole valley around Jerusalem there was filled with crosses where they had crucified people. If they got back inside their own, people killed them to get the grass. It's terrible. And finally, when that Roman general could take it no longer, he told those soldiers to go and take the city, but he gave them very, very clear orders to not touch the temple, to leave it alone. And in the middle of the fight, 
One of those soldiers threw a firebrand and it went right through the window of the temple. The curtains were on fire. In no time at all, that whole temple was burning. Burned. And after it was over in that temple, not only cedar walls, but many of those walls and articles were overlaid with gold. And that gold melted and ran down into the crevices of the rocks. And so when it was over, it says that the people came in and they pried every stone off the top of the other stone and gathered the gold that even plowed the ground. Josephus says there was enough gold in that temple to lower the price of gold on the world market by 50%. Just exactly as Jesus said. Now listen as he continues. And says, and then there will be a great tribulation, <clears throat> such as not been since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. He said there was going to come a time of great tribulation like the world has never known before. And he said it will never be again. And you and I are acquainted with that period of time known in history as the Dark Ages, a period of time when man seemed to forget everything that he knew. And instead of going on forward, he backed up and went backwards into the darkness and stayed in the dark for hundreds and hundreds of years. Terrible period of time. The lords and the barons ruled. They took the books away from people and they took the Bible away from them. They chained them to library walls and they told the people they were too ignorant to read. Horrible was the period of the dark ages. He said that they could expect that to come upon the world, the time of the dark ages. But now listen carefully because the scripture begins to move on down into our day, and this is what it says. <clears throat> immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after the dark ages, that's what it's saying, immediately after that time of tribulation, the dark ages, it says the sun will be what? Darkened. As the world is coming out of that dark ages, it says that the sun is going to go dark. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. You remember, we hit about the 1500s and then we find the Renaissance beginning to open up and then comes the Reformation until finally we get into close of the end of the 1700s and we find that man is not just then beginning to come out of the darkness. Just exactly as God prophesied, 10 o'clock in the morning, the people have gotten up, they've gone to work, everything seems to be normal, it seems to be a day like every other day of the week, but all of a sudden at 10 o'clock in the morning, the old sun went dark. I'm not talking about an eclipse. I'm talking about 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun went dark and there is no scientific explanation for it to this day. Historians have recorded what happened. This is what they say about it. The remarkable dark day of May 19, 1780 is described by Samuel Williams of Harvard. The professor relates that the obscuration approached with the clouds from the southwest between the hours of 10 and 11 a.m. and continued until the middle of the next night, varying in degree and duration in different localities. In some places, persons could not see to read common print in the open air for several hours, although this was not generally the case. Candles were lighted up in the houses. The birds, having sung their evening songs, disappeared and became silent. The fowls returned to roost. The cocks were crowing all around as the break of day. Objects could not be distinguished, but at a very little distance, everything bore the appearance and the gloom of night. Think of it. 10 o'clock in the morning, it just went dark. God said it marked. It marked a particular time. We'll talk about that period of time, but it marked the time known in Scripture as the time of the end. Listen as it continues to talk about it. <clears throat> Timothy Dwight, president of Yale, remembered that a very general opinion prevailed that the day of judgment was what? Oh, what would you think if it went 10, dark 10 o'clock in the morning and it wasn't an eclipse? We'd probably think it was the judgment also. 
All right, it says, the Connecticut House of Representatives, being unable to transact their business, adjourned. No electric lights. So they sent everybody home. <clears throat> Said, we'll just quit for today. Can't trans transact our business. But the council, that's the Senate. Okay, the council, it says, but the council lighted candles, preferring, as a member said, to be found at work if the judgment was approaching. He said, well, if the Lord's coming, I'd just soon be found at work. And so they lit candles and stayed after it. But as Christ prophesied, 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun went dark. And not only said that the sun would go dark, but it says that the moon would turn the color of blood that night as the moon rose it was the color of blood they also have described it history has recorded what happened there what took place and it says this about it describing it, it says there was the appearance of midnight at noonday and in the evening although the moon was just past full Perhaps it was never darker since the children of Israel left the house of bondage. In connection with this extraordinary phenomenon, the moon was reported to appear the color of blood. As it rose that night, it was the color of blood. Listen to one more. For several days past, the atmosphere has been remarkably changed with dry, smoky vapors so that the sun may be viewed easily with the naked eye the disk of the moon through the nights of Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday was of reddish copper color. See, God said there would be signs first in the sun, then in the moon, and then he said there would next be signs where? In the stars. It's described. A man describes waking up about three in the morning, hearing people moaning and groaning said he went outside and here people were laying on the ground, many of them beating on the ground and moaning, and he said the stars were falling from heaven like snow. Picture this history describes it, and God's Word said that's exactly what would happen, and it took place just as God said it would. Listen, this is what it says about it. The morning of November the 13th, 1833, says an eyewitness, a Yale astronomer, was rendered memorable by an exhibition of a phenomenon called shooting stars, which was probably more extensive and magnificent than any similar one hitherto recorded. Probably no celestial phenomenon has ever occurred in this country since its first settlement, which was viewed with so much admiration and delight by one class of spectators, or with so much astonishment and fear by another class. Oh, they saw the stars falling like snow. Another statement. From the Gulf of Mexico to Halifax, until daylight with some difficulty put an end to the display, the sky was scored in every direction with shining tracks and illuminated with majestic fireballs. At Boston, the frequency of the meters was estimated to be about half that of the flakes of snow in an average snowstorm, traced backwards, their paths were invariably found to converge to a point in the constellation Leo. So it says that the stars fell like snow, just exactly as God said they would. He had predicted that those signs would be signs of the end. Listen, it says, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. These same signs that I have just read to you, you find that they took place at the end of the tribulation. They marked the beginning of the time of the end, but those same signs will be repeated again just before Jesus comes. Talks about it. When it talks about them coming on the day of the Lord, it's talking about them happening at the time Jesus comes. But listen as he talks about other signs that are going to take place. It says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Oh, as we hit the 1800s, we find that a complete change takes place with man. Look at something just as simple as the wheel with me. You take just something 
like wheel. Go back with me. Go back with me clear to the days of Abraham of old. And let me ask you, how fast did that wheel turn in the days of Abraham? Just turned as fast as a horse could pull it, right? As fast as it could turn. Now, come on down. Let's come down a 1,000 years, 2,000 years, 3,000 years. Let's come clear down to the days of George Washington. And let me ask you, how fast did that wheel turn in the days of George Washington? Only as fast as a horse could pull it. But you hit the beginning of the 1800s, and man all of a sudden begins to put steam to that wheel, and then electricity, and all of a sudden man now is traveling at speeds that he has never known before. Begins to go and move and travel like has never been recorded. Go back a hundred years tonight. Go back 100 years, and what happens? Why, your modern conveniences disappear, our means of travel disappear, all that. Just in a hundred years, man has now moved in ways that he never dreamed possible for. It also says that knowledge would be increased. You see, it doesn't make any difference what kind of work you're in, what kind of profession you have, what kind of job you do. Do you know that there's more written about your line of work than you can read? In the last 50 years, knowledge has doubled every 10 years. Just has absolutely exploded a sign of the time in which you and I are living today when it says that that would mark. Please notice that text in Daniel says very clearly, Seal the book even to the what? The time of the end. And you and I tonight are living in the time of the end. But he continues to talk about signs and says there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, what? Distress of nations with perplexities. And I want to tell you tonight, the nations are distressed. Now there's things bothering them that they would give anything to know the answer to. And I'm not talking about war. They've got problems that are much more serious than war. They'd like to know what to do with them. They don't know what to do with them. Let me share some things that are real problems. One is simply what we would call a population explosion. Statesmen, world leaders would do anything to know what to do with that. Have you stopped to consider? Oh, you say, we're not having a population explosion? No, we're not here in the United States. They're not having one over in Western Europe. They're not having one in Australia. But if you think that makes up the world, then you better take another look. Because when you take a look at the third world, different story altogether. In fact, there have been several books written about the problem of population. And let me just give you some ideas. When President Carter was in office, he had a global 2000 report done. And in that report, they gave a high, a medium, and a low average. And by the way, the statistics they gave at that time are still dead on. This is what he says was happening. You're taking the United States here. Uh, we don't really have a problem. In 1975, we had 214 million people in the United States. They project by 2000 A.D. we will have 248 million. Uh, that's not a great growth. That's nothing for us to get excited about. But boy, you go south. Go down in here into Latin America. And in 1975, they had 325 million. By 2000 A.D., that will be 637 million. Now, do you understand what that means? I held a meeting over in Bogota, Colombia. That's a city of 5 million people. they projecting that by 2000 A.D. it will be 15 million people. Mexico City, a city now of about 15, 16 million. By 2000 A.D. they're projecting 31 million. And I can tell you, you people that live here and people that live along the border, like in El Paso and San Antonio and all those cities along there, you want me to give you some advice? You better learn Spanish. Tell you for sure. 
They're not going to stay over there. They're going to come over and you better learn. It makes a difference. Let's look at a few others. I don't have time to go and take Africa. In 1975, they had 399 million. By 2000 AD, they will have 814 million. And the next figure I read to you, you won't understand any more than I do. I don't understand those figures. Take Asia. Asia at that, in 1975, had 2 billion, 274 million. It's just hard for me to comprehend. By 2000 AD, it will be 3 billion, 300, 630 million. That's what's happening. It's just growing by leaps and bounds. And they like to know what to do with it. 74 million people added every year. That means every three years you have another United States of America. You take India. It just Let me just give you some statistics you won't understand. If India built 20,000 new schools every day, day in and day out, 20,000 new schools every day, for the next 20 years, she still wouldn't have enough schools for her kids. Our population was, for a good while, at 4 billion. It's now 5 billion. That's what our population has done. Just exploding, and they would like to know what to do with it. They don't know quite what to do with it. This is what one man said, Dr. Philip Handler. He said, raise the possibility that the developed world may simply decide to forget the countries of South Asia to give them up as hopeless. Do you understand what he's saying? Well, he's saying that here's a ship that's out in the ocean full of people, and it begins to sink. On that ship is one lifeboat. They put the lifeboat over, and people get in the lifeboat until that lifeboat is completely full. In the water are hundreds of people still yet. But they have to make a decision on that lifeboat. They have to decide that they're not going to let anybody else on the lifeboat because it'll sink. Everybody else has to drown. That's the decision that he's talking about. The only problem with that is what bothers me is one-third of those people in that lifeboat have great big suitcases and television sets with them. That bothers me. But that's what he's saying. You say, well, does it really bother us? Does it really affect us? Well, let me see if I can illustrate it a way maybe that you'll understand. Let's say that this farmer one day walks out into his pasture where he has a pond. Take a look at his pond, and as he's looking at his pond, on his pond, he sees a water lily. Never had a water lily on his pond before, and he thinks that looks pretty nice. Have a water lily there. And so he goes on about his business, and the next day he comes back, and is looking at the pond, and lo and behold, there's two water lilies there. And he thinks, that's, that's real nice. I like those water lilies. Now, what this farmer doesn't understand is those water lilies have the ability to reproduce themselves every day. And so as he's going on about his work, those water lilies are multiplying all the time. And one day he walks out there, and lo and behold, his pond is half full of water lilies. And he said, I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to do something with these water lilies. If I don't, they're going to take over my pond. Now, I want to ask you a question. How much time does he have to do something? He's got one day. That's it. Now, that's what the population does, friends. See, people are saying, well, it's not going to affect me, and we've hit 5 billion, and then I can tell you, almost overnight, we're going to face some problems like people have never dreamed possible for. When you get the growth that we're having with population, the next thing that you're going to face is a food shortage. That's the reason when you go to the supermarket now, even now, you go there sometimes, and there's not any of a certain product on the shelf. There's not enough food to go around. There's people in the world that are starving. You, you don't understand that. You live here in this country and you don't understand it. Have you ever been in a place where people are starving? Have you ever watched children running their hands through the sewer trying to find something to eat? You ever watched that? 
Have you ever been to countries where it depresses you so bad that you don't know what you're going to do because there's nothing you can do for them? It's what it's talking about. Not enough food, where people go to bed hungry night after night. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be what? Famines. Indeed, there is. All over the world today, there's famines. Not enough food for the people to eat. They had a meeting of world leaders over in Rome here a while back to discuss the problem of food. They met together for one week, dismissed and went home without one resolution. They didn't know what to do. That's the situation concerning food. There's just not enough out there for people to eat. In the book of James, it talks about a problem. It says, indeed, the wages of the laborers who have mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Now, what James is talking about here, he's talking about the economy. He's talking about how man has handled the economy, and he said there's some people that have lived in pleasure and luxury while others were starving to death. That's what he's saying. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now, I want you to listen carefully. Therefore, be what? Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. He says these things that he says about the economy are definite signs of the coming of the Lord. And as I told you, the economy is not a problem of just the United States. The economy is a problem worldwide. You let the United States get in trouble economically, and I guarantee you other countries are in trouble, and you let other countries get in trouble, and we're in trouble. Get it clear, it's not just a problem of one country, it's worldwide. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. Now listen, as James applies it here, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He said, when you see the problem of economy, he said, be patient. The Lord's coming, not long. The problems that we're faced today with of unemployment, it's all over the world. Not enough jobs, not enough work. I go to countries, different countries, where I find people with tremendous educations, gone through elementary school, high school, through the university, on into graduate study, and not a job. Can't put their hands on a job anywhere. There's not employment for them. We go into places and we find that there are all kinds of problems. Can you remember when you could buy gas for 28 cents? Huh? Can you remember that? Oh, it hadn't been that long ago. Pay 28 cents for gas. And then you remember, you got up one morning, it was 31 cents, and you said, well, it probably needed to go to that. And you didn't think anything about it. You said, well, that, that's okay. Probably needed to do that. And then one day, somebody yelled, shortage, and gas jumped to 55 cents a gallon. And since that day, it's continued to just go up and up and up until today, it's over a dollar a gallon. And you ought to thank the Lord for that. Because I've been in places of the world, I drove my truck. I held a crusade down in the country of Panama, also in Costa Rica. I filled up my pickup in Costa Rica, and it cost me over a hundred dollars just to fill it. Gas was over $3 a gallon. One economist had this to say about it. England is flat broke, floundering economically and caught in an endless Irish conflict. Italy is mired in chaos. Portugal harbors on the edge of tumult. Spain may soon approach a similar shape. Japan's dynamism shows signs of dissolving like a wet noodle. 
South Asia is disintegrating, much of Africa starves, and the richest oil sheiks have accumulated so much money that they don't even know how to budget it. And that's pretty much the economy of the world today. Jesus said, you better watch out. You better be extremely careful. Listen. Do not lay up for yourself treasure on the earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. I can tell you right now, if your security is wrapped up in the dollar bill, you got it in the wrong place. That's the only security you have is in what you've got in dollars. Dear friend, you're in trouble. You better get your security in the book, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I can tell you, the dollar is temporary. It's not going to stay around on and on. You better put it in something much, much more permanent than the dollar. That's a sign of the times that we're living in. Paul. Paul was writing to Timothy, and he was describing the conditions in the last days. This is what he said about him. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. He said, expect it. In the last days, there's going to be perilous times. You might as well expect that to happen. That's going to take place. Now he describes it. For men will be lovers of themselves. Oh, that's sure true today. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Sounds like my newspaper. It's what it sounds like. You read it and that's the way people are. Describing the condition of the, of the world. Unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. I, I, I just stand absolutely amazed when I read things in magazines and I read it in the newspaper and stuff and I find that there are people that are absolutely despisers of anything that's good. Hard for me to understand that. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. And boy, we live in a world that way today. I can tell you today, people think if they aren't entertained, that there's something wrong what they're interested in, being entertained. Just finished a survey of a whole section of a, of a state here in the United States. And they were surveying it concerning the religious of the deal on the people, how the people felt about religion. And the two things that came out more prominent than anything else as they interviewed person after person about their religious conviction is the two things they wanted is they wanted to be entertained and they didn't want any commitment. That's the condition of the world today. Lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people turn away. Paul said they have a form of godliness but deny its power. It's power to change their lives and to make them different. And God's looking for men and women today. They're willing to walk with him, to follow him, to follow his calling. These are signs, signs of the time, signs of the times that we're living in, signs that ought to be telling you and I, dear friend, that Jesus is coming back. We need to get, be getting ready for the coming of the Lord. We need to be looking for his coming. Jesus had some very pointed words to say about this. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. He said, you walk out there, you look at the sky in the evening, and it's red, and you say, oh, tomorrow's going to be a nice day. Fair weather. We have a saying for that, don't we? goes like this. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Oh, yeah. Whole sky in the west is red. We say, oh, tomorrow's going to be a real nice day. He continues. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. 
get up, and boy, the old eastern sky is red, and we say, watch out. Going to have a storm today. Bad weather. We have a saying to go with that too, don't we? Red sky in the morning. Sailor, take warning. Watch out. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Oh, he said, you can go out there and you can look and you can say, oh, it's going to be good weather today or it's going to be bad weather today. And he said, you can discern the weather, but he said, you can't even pick up the word of God and read it and see what it says and discern the signs of the times. Oh, Christian people today ought to be able to read God's word and tell where we are. We ought to know where we are in the stream of time. We ought to know clearly that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. It's not going to be long. I can tell you right now, one of these days before you and I know it, time is simply going to swing on its hinges and become eternity. Jesus is going to come. The signs are all telling us that we're living in the time when Jesus is coming back in the clouds of heaven. Even with thunderous tones, they are approaching, telling us that Jesus is coming back. You and I need to be getting ready, waiting, looking, longing for the coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, this evening, I want you to listen very carefully as Steve sings about the coming of the Lord. Bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight, we thank you for the promise that Jesus is coming. We ask that each of us may open our eyes, that we may be aware of the signs of the times, that we may hear the soon approaching of our Lord and Savior, and that each one here may reach out in faith, accept thee, place their lives in your hands. They may be among those that will look up into the heavens and say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he'll save us. For this we ask in Christ's name, amen. Tonight's subject is a very special one, one that I particularly enjoy preaching on. Our subject tonight is Reunion Day in Heaven. You see, I believe that heaven is icing on the cake. As far as I'm concerned, if there was no heaven at all, I would live a Christian life. I don't think there's anything better I don't think the world has anything to offer compared to a life in Christ Jesus. And to me, heaven's just icing on the cake. And so tonight, we're going to look at what the Bible says about heaven. We're going to talk about people that went to heaven, two people that went to heaven and came back. We're going to tell you four ways to recognize your loved ones in heaven. And so we hope that you will be here. Some people have some very strange ideas about heaven. They think you're going to be an invisible spirit floating on an invisible cloud, playing an invisible harp that makes an inaudible sound. <laughs> That's heaven. I don't want to go there. But we're going to see what the Bible has to say about heaven this evening. 